Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is John Hilton. I've been an editor with Insurance News Net and covered the uh, financial services industry for the past eight years. I'm here today at the NAFA Annuity Forum and I have with me Sutton White from uh, Life Innovators. Welcome Sutton. Thanks John. Why don't you uh, describe a little bit for our audience what you do and what Life Innovators does? Yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> my background, I've been in the industry over 20 years. Um, I started on the distribution side with Wachovia. That's how long ago that was. Went through the Wells Fargo merger. Um, I then left and went down to Atlanta to run the annuity platform at SunTrust, their broker-dealer. Um, I then left there in 2014, moved back to Charlotte um, to work for MetLife. So I went from the distribution side to the manufacturing side. Um, immediately started working on the spinoff with Bright House. Um, went through the spinoff and then in 2018 moved over to Jackson National um, and ran their fixed indexed and RILA product development over there. Uh, in 2021, I had an opportunity to, to come to Life Innovators with Bobby Samuelson and um, I'm the head of annuity product. So um, we do every, we're a turnkey product development shop, but we do more than just product development. We do um, you know, consultations with um, holding companies that are looking to get into the industry, um, offer turnkey services around standing up insurance carriers, all the way from you know, the IT stack to product development to distribution. So we kind of cover the, cover the gamut on, on that. So we've been doing that. It'll be uh, two years next month. Oh, excellent. And how are things going? Uh, I know annuities are selling <laughs> way beyond record numbers. So, I mean, you picked a good time to jump into uh, a new venture like that. I mean, how are things going? Yeah, it's always better to be lucky than good, right? So uh, we certainly timed it right. Um, you know, I think we were trying to be at or near capacity at a year. We were there about six months into it. Um, we since hired three people, um, a couple of actuaries and a sales and marketing head. Um, and we continue to, to get new contracts. So we've got um, five products in market now. Um, we're looking to have a, a sixth um, probably later this year and a seventh the first of 2024. So we're, we're extremely busy. Okay, excellent. All right, well, let's take advantage of some of your wealth of experience here. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about index products today, specifically uh, indexed annuity products. Yep. So. Uh, Talk a little bit about, I mean, these products are some of the best selling products uh, on the uh, market. So talk about why that is. What, why does everyone want an indexed product? Yeah, I think there's a couple reasons. So 2022 was a record year for FIA. Um, you know, it was a little over $79 billion in sales, um, which was an all time record for fixed indexed annuities. Um, you know, we think the drivers are, are uh, for a couple reasons. One, um, you know, the protection of principal, right? So, you know, as folks are moving from the accumulation stage in their retirement or pre-retirement to retirement, um, they're much more sensitive to being able to have principal protection and not have to go through some of the market corrections and volatility that they may have gone through in the past, right? And obviously, as you get closer to retirement, the time to recover your portfolio gets much shorter. Um, so being able to protect principal with still having some upside growth is, is certainly important. So um, that's been the primary driver. Um, you know, I think there's some secondary drivers such as, um, you know, the, the, a flight to safety, um, not only principal protection, but being able to um, allocate amongst different index options or even a fixed account. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility inside of one contract. Um, so those are a couple of the reasons we've seen for, for FIA and why they've, they've continued to take off. Yeah, and uh, even though uh, interest rates have climbed to heights we haven't seen in quite some time, uh, index products continue to sell well. I saw you recently in Utah at another conference <laughs> and you, you uh, mentioned uh, registered index linked annuities continue to sell very well. So uh, are these products immune to uh, not only interest rates, but economic conditions as they seem to be? No, they're definitely not immune. I think, um, you know, interest rate, the, the rise in interest rates actually help FIAs more than they do RILAs. Um, you know, as you've seen interest rates go up, you've actually seen cap rates go up because the options budget that um, the carriers have to spend is actually larger 
in a rising rate environment. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting the dynamics of what we've seen where um, engineered indices um, or prop, pr proprietary indices um, had garnered the lion's share of, um, of, of the market for the past few years, um, driven mainly because interest rates were so low, it was hard to offer a competitive cap on an S&P or another traditional index. What we saw last year was um, the allocations to engineered indices went down um, from about 60 percent to um, about 38 percent, um, and the rise in S&P, as well as a rise in allocation to fixed accounts. So, um, you know, I think what we're seeing is probably a correction in terms of um, historically FIAs, the engineered indices were um, not quite as prevalent as they have been in the, the low interest rate environment. As interest rates continue to rise or level off and stay high, I think we'll continue to see you know, more folks allocating to the S&P and, and other traditional indices and maybe not quite as much uh, allocation to the engineered indices. So um, yeah, that's. Okay, interesting. So let's get into these indices. Now I, uh, I've been told that 15, 20 years ago, there were maybe a handful of indices, and now there's over 150. Mm -hmm. So, and the growth is obviously in proprietary indices with uh, fancy names like Mosaic. <laughs> and uh, so, can you talk a little bit about why? Why does everyone want their own index, and what are some of the problems with these? Yeah, so, it's a great question. I would say, um, yeah, the the amount of you know what we call engineered indices. Some people call them smart beta indices, proprietary indices. Um, basically, it's an index that's created, um, you know, maybe not just for the purpose of being in an indexed annuity product, but you know they might have this index live and it's in a um, fee-based platform or you know some other platform other than annuity. Uh, some are created specifically for the annuity, but um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the interest rate environment is really what drove the proliferation of it because it was just impossible to get a competitive cap rate on the S&P. Um, even, you know, two years ago, we were seeing caps on the S&P at 4%, 3.5%, where you can offer a, a, a proprietary engineered index and have, you know, a, a much higher cap, a cap that's stable. Um, but generally you'll see participation rates and they'll have you know, very high participation rates. Um, the trade-off with these indices is generally that they have some kind of vol control. And what vol control does or volatility control does is it allows the, um, the index provider to kind of know, have guardrails. So they're going to kind of know where the return is going to be. Um, and if vol gets really high, um, you know, they don't have to worry about the return getting out of, you know, super high. If, if the return is low, they don't have to worry about, you know, necessarily a, a huge downside. So it gives them kind of a corridor to operate, which allows them to keep options prices steady, which also allows for them to provide steady cap rates and participation rates, which from a consumer standpoint is very helpful, right? Um, you know, I think we've seen certainly in the last year with where interest rates have gone, where volatility is, um, interest, um, Sorry, renewal rates have not been as competitive as people would have expected them to be. Um, and this kind of helps that conversation, the fact that, you know, for some of these engineered indices, you know, your, your cap or par rate is going to stay steady. And that's mainly because of the agreement between the hedging partner and the carrier or the counterparty. Um, you know, they have a fixed options cost on these. Um, you know, the downside is there's not really a huge market for the options. So you're... Um, you know, if you're buying a or if you're offering a proprietary index, you're kind of beholden to whoever your counterparty is, right? So um, it can get um, you know a little tough for a carrier if they were wanting to go out and have a competitive bid on options prices. Um, they're not able to do that, right? So um, you know that in turn leads to you know is it competitive? Is it not? And with the vol control component, um, you know, it makes it even a little bit less transparent around um, how these indices actually work and what the returns are. Um, you know, my, my concern with the proprietary indices is, so you mentioned, you know, the proliferation of proprietary indices. 
I think the last number I heard was around 180, <clears throat> excuse me. We track about 160, uh, and I was actually going through those numbers recently, and last year, 2022, the number of those in, out of 160 indices, um, there were seven that were positive. So, you know, I think going back to the allocation to these proprietary indices, um, you know, a lot of folks that kind of got whipsawed in this high volatility um, period in 2022 are looking at these proprietary indices and going, well, you know, okay, I thought this was supposed to sort of uh, levelize my return. And even if the you know, market is bad, I might get a slight return. Um, and I think what we saw was that it didn't necessarily help in terms of counter, um, counterbalancing the overall market. Um, and even going into 2023, looking at it, there's a lot of indices that are positive, but they're nowhere near the S&P, right? So, you know, if you're looking for an equity-like return in these products, that's not really what these products are built for, right? So I think a lot of it goes to, does the client understand what they're buying? Does the um, producer understand what they're selling? And, you know, if they're okay with, you know, middle of the road type returns and they're not looking for equity returns, um, then they're probably okay. But I think some people go into these products thinking 100% downside protection and equity like returns, what could go wrong? And, you know, I think 2022 was kind of a reckoning for that where it was like, okay, well, now I'm, I understand better that these are going to be more fixed income type returns than, than equity type returns. Uh -huh. So really Sutton, you just mentioned the problem there. Only seven out of 180 or so are really returning a profit. So uh, clients end up disappointed. So that leads us to our next topic. They end up disappointed because they were shown an illustration of, to quote one lawsuit I recently covered, 6%. So uh, they're connected, right? So mm -hmm. uh, indexes lead to illustrations. What are the problems with illustrations? Yeah, so I think that is probably the number one um, concern for these engineered indices. They don't have any actual historical data. Most of them don't. Um, <clears throat> so when a carrier um, launches or offers a proprietary index, they're counting on backcasted or backtested returns, uh, which essentially is, you know, if this index had been around in 2008, this is how it should have performed based on the rules of the index. Um, now, you know, the problem with that is there's no actual data to be able to say, yes, it did perform or it didn't perform that way. So um, you get into a little bit of an illustration problem where, um, you know, carriers are, are illustrating these back-tested results and saying, hey, this, this index would have averaged 11% over the last 20 years. Um, the problem is you don't know what it would have actually done. So when a, when a client buys it and expects an average of an 11% return in something that's principal protected, generally you're setting yourself up for disappointment, right? So, um, you know, that's where, you know, the proprietary indices get into a little bit of an issue. And again, it goes back to understanding what's being bought and what's being sold. If you understand that a proprietary index might offer a good non-correlated asset to the market, um, or, you know, that it, it provides some diversification in your portfolio, then it's 100% um, you know, gonna, gonna do that for you. Um, but if you're expecting 11 or 12% average return on something that has a vol control um, and is um, you know, a non-correlated asset, it's probably not realistic, right? Um, I think the other place where illustrations run into an issue is, you know, some illustrations illustrate uh, back tested performance, some are illustrating income riders or death benefit riders. And that's where it gets also a little um, concerning because if you're illustrating an, uh, an income rider and you know, depending on how the income rider is structured, it might depend on strong market returns to provide you know, some astronomical income amount. Um, and when the performance isn't there and the income amount isn't there, um, you know, it, it tends to upset the client because they're like, well, I thought I was going to have a million dollars a year to retire on. I have $200,000, you know, what's the deal, right? So, you know, I think illustrations can be a handy tool, but um, they should definitely be a tool and not necessarily, you know, the primary selling 
uh, option of, of an annuity. Mm -hmm. So that leads us to the regulators. Mm -hmm. And insurance, of course, regulated at the state level, and the state uh, association of insurance commissioners have been targeting these illustrations for some time now. Uh, they have settled on AG 49B right now, and I listened to one speaker recently say there could be an AG 49C as they mm -hmm. continue down this road. What are your thoughts on, I guess these are kind of patches, let's yeah. call them. So yeah. what, what do you think will happen, and... Uh, what are your thoughts on this kind of patching they're doing? Yeah, I, and you know, AG forty nine B and potentially AG forty nine C are really offshoots from the IUL illustration, so Index Universal Life, um, which to me is a little bit different from a fixed index annuity uh, in terms of um, you know an illustrated rate on an IUL is can become a problem because of cost of insurance, it's embedded in the index universal life contract. Um, so if performance doesn't meet a certain threshold, you actually could wind up either losing money because of cost of insurance or even having your policy lapse. So the, the, the performance on the illustration for an IUL, much more important um, in terms of how the policy is gonna behave than with a fixed index annuity. The fixed index annuity, the worst case you're gonna have is zero. Right, unless mm -hmm. you have some type of rider or something on there that's deducting a fee, um, you know your um, your principal is is always protected. So you know, I, I that being said, and going back to what we were talking about, I, I I would foresee some type of regulation coming down for FIA illustrations. Um, you know, maybe not quite as um, arduous as AG forty nine B or C, but you know something that you know puts in. Um, you know, some level of parity of what's being illustrated versus what a realistic return is, whether it's, you know, comparing the, the backcasted results to a benchmark indice or to a 60-40 portfolio or something like that. I do think it's important to offer transparency to, you know, the client and the producer to be able to, you know, accurately benchmark, like, here's what the backtested results are, but here's a more likely case of what it might look like, right? Um, if for nothing else to help facilitate that conversation between the producer and the client to level set the, the expectation on it. So Sutton, recently uh, you were in Salt Lake City for another conference and talking a lot about uh, registered index link annuities. And uh, you're bullish on uh, RILAs continuing to perform very well. Uh, could you maybe summarize, and I don't know if there's any updates in a couple months since then, but could you summarize why you feel that way? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, like I said at the conference, I think since Rylas really came out in 2010 and when they started to start to get a lot of traction in 2014, the question has always been, well, that's great, but what happens when we have a market correction or what happens when interest rates rise? And FIAs become more competitive, and um, you know maybe Rylas aren't quite as um, you know the shining star, right? Because you know part of the reason Rylas gained popularity, and there's multiple reasons, but one of the reasons is because they could offer much higher cap rates than an, than an FIA could in a time of low interest rates, and that's mainly due to the fact that Rylas are are priced a lot on volatility, um, and that there's some downside participation, so that allows you to offer a higher higher upside. Um, in 2022, I was actually pretty pleased to see that RILAs were only up 6%, um, you know, year over year. I, I would have anticipated RILAs would have been down um, as we saw FIAs have a record year um, and even fixed annuities like MIGAs. Um, but the fact was that, you know, RILAs still continued to see growth even as FIAs had a record year, even as fixed annuities had a record year even as interest rates rose. So, you know, to me, it's an indicator that the RILA category is, is certainly a, um, a, a permanent category. Um, I think the other thing is that as we see some regulations start to um, kind of ease a little bit on the requirements for filing RILAs, uh, I would anticipate seeing more carriers get into the market, um, which is why I'm still pretty bullish. I know there's a lot of carriers that want to be in the market, but um, feel like the filing requirements are a little bit arduous and just aren't willing to do that. So, um, you know, the, it's 
it certainly, I think, was a, was good news for Ryla that 2022, um, they, they continued to see growth, um, and they're, they're, they're still showing moderate growth this year as well. So, um, you know, I think not that 2022 was the ultimate test, but it certainly was a test and one that I feel like Ryla, the category, um, passed pretty well. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, Sutton, as I cover some uh, lawsuits on uh, uh, FIA sales gone bad, uh, disgruntled uh, clients, customers, uh, the companies come back to the disclosures. You know, mm-hmm. you signed this. Uh, it was in bold even. Um, you know, do you feel the disclosures are effective in these cases or in general? You know, I, I'm not a lawyer, so it's hard for me to say <laughs> one way or another, but I would say, you know, based on my experience, um, the disclosures are generally pretty thorough. Um, where I think the um, class action suits are focusing on and where the disclosures may not go is around the indices and the index performance, right? Generally, when you see a, a disclosure, it's around the product, um, it's around suitability, it's around you know um, the core of, of what the client's buying. Um, the index isn't the index allocation isn't always part of that because, one, you can change index allocations at any time in most products. So um, having it as part of the core disclosure may or may not be effective. If you go into if you allocate in the S&P and then a year later you're allocating in a proprietary index, there's no real way to update a disclosure to provide anything to the client. Um, I think where some of these um, lawsuits have, have sort of, um, you know, dialed into is, um, you know, certain parts of, of the indices and, um, you know, the one that I've seen personally is around excess return, right? And not disclosing um, the impact of what the risk-free rate does in an excess return index, right? So for so long, the risk, uh, risk-free risk return rate was zero, right? Because interest rates were so low. Now, all of a sudden, because treasuries have spiked up so high, the risk-free rate might be around three, four, five percent, depending on when you're looking at it. So these excess return indices that are illustrated with a zero percent um, risk-free rate are now performing in, an, in a market where it's a five percent risk-free rate, which means it creates almost a hurdle, right? A hurdle rate that the index has to get over before it starts to um, you know, credit any positive returns. So you know, when you look at it um, in an excess return world, um, that's created a lot of concern you know, from the client saying, hey, this was never disclosed to me that if the risk-free rate or how excess return worked or if the risk-free rate moved up, like it would impact my returns on the index, right? So I think it'll be interesting to see where this all lands because, again, um, you know, an illustration is just that. It's an illustration, um, you know, and there's lots of caveats around past performance is not indicative of future results. Um, So I think it's going to be interesting to see where the courts land in terms of, yes, this wasn't disclosed um, specifically, but, you know, there is a buyer beware um, type caveat on most of these illustrations. Um, And if you're buying this for index return or performance, um, you know, it could turn into more of a suitability issue than a a product functionality issue. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Okay, so I think a, a good place to end would be um, uh, we've seen these products evolve uh, over the years. So maybe is there anything coming next or what would be the next evolution of an index product? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we're certainly seeing some innovations on the product side um, in terms of um, the designs, right? There's, there's new designs coming out, um, including one that, We've actually helped um, design that um, actually allows you to open up floors in your gains to, to get higher cap rates um, and still comply with non-forfeiture and all the things that make it a fixed index annuity. So I think we're continuing to see innovation on the product side. Um, on the index side, we're also seeing a lot of innovation. You know, I, I've kind of look at it, we're in the third, I would say, proprietary index 3.0. Um, proprietary indices 1.0 were you know, 10, 15 years ago, maybe they had a 5% vol control, but there wasn't a lot of, um, wasn't a lot of uh, counterbalance. So, you know, um, and I think we saw that a lot in 22, 2022, where 
uh, clients got whipsawed where you know volatility was high the index did what it was supposed to do which was move them into you know cash or you know fixed income or you know some kind of asset other than equities and then when equities bounced back there wasn't enough um, time for it to move back and capture the upside of the equity so they kind of got all a lot of the downside and very little of the upside um, but I think what index providers have figured out is, hey, we can do things like intraday vol, right? So there's, there's indices that are coming out that have multiple looks at volatility and, and we'll, we'll manage that volatility five to seven times a day versus weekly or monthly, which is what you know, some of the initial ones did. Um, you know, and trying to stay within that vol control, right? So um, you know, if it's a 5% vol control, I think what some of the studies have shown is it was actually a 2% vol control because you know, it was moving in and out so quickly that it actually you know, tamped the vol down too tightly. Um, so having multiple looks at the vol you know, during the day or during the week um, is something that we're seeing as a trend, which I think is going to help performance. Also moving the vol control target up, right? Um, and that's due to higher interest rates. You have more options budget, so you can... Um, have higher vol targets. So, you know, I think, you know, 10, 12, 15% vol targets are kind of what we're seeing now um, versus 5%, which was, you know, what was earlier. Um, and, you know, the, um, the types of um, IP or intellectual property that's going into the indices has gotten much more, um, it's gotten more complex, but it's also, I think, carrying a little bit more consumer value. We're seeing things like AI and ESG, um, which, you know, take it or leave it, you know, ESG is um, one of the hot dots in terms of category. So it's not just multi-asset 60-40 um, portfolio with a 5% vol control. There's actually um, new, different, and, and, you know, possibly more valuable um, intellectual property and ideas going into these indices to try to help um, replicate more market-like returns than what we've seen in the past. All right, Sutton, uh, thanks for uh, joining us. We really appreciate it. Lots of great stuff. Yeah, thanks, John. Take care.